Well, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11. We're going to be reading 1127 to verse 12, 9, as we continue in our series, Foundations, where we've been looking at and focusing on foundational truths for our Christian faith and for our Christian practice. I wonder, how many of us in here, I, don't, I know we wouldn't want to maybe admit it readily, but how many of us in here have, have ever let anyone down? You don't have to raise your hand. You ever let someone down? I mean, I, I literally feel like I live my entire life trying not to let people down. Like, that's part of, like, how I live my life. I, I remember growing up, I used to dread hearing those awful words, I'm disappointed in you. I hate those words with a passion, and I, I actually have come to a place where I don't like to even say them to my son because I know how, how much of a mark they left on me. But in, many times in my life, listen, we're all human in here, right? Many times in my life, I've let people down. I've let some of you down. I know that. I've let other people down. But I remember specifically a time in my life when I was in my senior year of college, I took on too much. I mean, let's just put, put it this way. I, I was working 40 hours a week at Chick-fil-A. I was taking a full load at school, and I was interning at a church. So I had all of my time was planned out. I had to plan every minute of my day down to the time I would sleep, when I would eat. Everything had to be planned out perfectly. And what would happen naturally, and what happened naturally during that uh, during that time in my life is I began to become tired, burned out. And I began to come to this place where I was letting people down regularly. And the one person that I kept letting down over and over again was the pastor who I was interning for. I, 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 we had an agreed upon time. I would be there certain days between this time and this time. And I was regularly showing up 15 to 20 minutes late. I remember uh, there was a couple things that he had asked me to do that I just completely forgot about, and, and I just let him down. I kept letting him down over and again. And over and again, he continued to show me grace and mercy. He continued to show me uh, love and kindness. Now, sometimes it had to be tough love, and he had to say, hey, you know, we need to get this thing together, or, or, or we need to work on things, but it was always with love and grace. And, and that continued to happen until I got the flu. Because <laughs> inevitably, what happens when you're doing too much, you are stretching yourself th so thin, you get sick. And that's what happened. And I was out for two weeks, and I felt like even in that moment, I was letting him down. And yet, he continued to give me grace. How many have had people in that, their life like that? You continually let them down, and yet they continually forgive and love and care. Some of you are those people. Some of you have had people in your life that have continually let you down time and again. And you continue to love and care and, and pray for them. Well, This morning, we are going to find in the story of Abram a person in whom we can always rely on. A person in whom we can never disappoint. Lots and lots of grace. To this point in the book of Genesis... We've seen a lot of things that have happened. And today we are going to see God calling Abram from among his people. And we're going to see a God who we can never let down. Let's stand together as we read the words here found in Genesis chapter 11. We'll read verses 27 of chapter 11 to chapter 12 verse 9. This is God's holy word. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in the Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarah, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his sons, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. 
Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of, to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai in the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. This is God's holy word. May he add its blessing to our heart this day. You may be seated. Well, to this point in the book of Genesis, we've seen really three major events that have happened. First, we saw God in the beginning chapters, the beginning words of the book of Genesis, create all things. And this was the large event, creation. Uh, Adam and Eve placed in the garden as the pinnacle of God's creation. And yet, in the midst of this beautiful paradise, we see sin entering in. And thus we have our second big event, the fall. The fall of man, the, the betrayal of God's goodness. But in the midst of that betrayal, we see God's mercy and grace and this promise of a seed, a, an offspring that will come from Eve that will be able to destroy the one who brought sin into the world. And this provides, of course, the tension for all of Genesis. We've been saying that every week. Every week we've been establishing what is the seed, who is the seed that's finally going to come and destroy Satan for good. So out of the fall, we have, after the fall, we have wickedness growing and growing. And then we have our next huge event, the flood. And we, we talked about this several weeks ago. But from the flood, we see, again, uh, this idea of a fall, a, 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 a kind of this breaking of God's promises, a breaking of God's fellowship. We see mercy in the midst of judgment. And that brings us to the final thing here, Babel, that we just talked about last week, where God, the wickedness again grew and God intervened. But in the midst of that, we ask the question, where is the mercy? It feels like God had been setting up this pattern in the book of Genesis. God does something good. Man poops all over it, basically. God is supposed to give judgment, but instead he gives mercy. We have that at creation. We have that at the flood. But in the Tower of Babel, it doesn't seem like there is mercy. Sure, we could say there's mercy in God doing what he wanted to do anyway with people and scattering them throughout the, the world. But really, there's no mercy in this book, in this story. And so the question becomes, where is the mercy in the midst of judgment? And that brings us to what we see in our, our passage today. The generations of Terah, the Toledot, the, the genealogy of this man. And now we've, we've known that through the book of Genesis that the author, who I believe is Moses, has been organizing the book around these genealogies. And we haven't been reading all of them because there's lots of names that are really hard, hard to pronounce and it's really repetitive. But these genealogies become important because it's tracing the line of the seed and it's asking the question, who is going to be the, the one who's going to destroy Satan. Until this time, though, in the book of Genesis, we've seen the focus more on the world at large. We've seen creation. We've seen a worldwide flood. We've seen the first great city. It's been more of a, a focus out here, but here in chapter 11, we see a shift in the focus, and the focus of the rest of the book of Genesis is going to be on one family, 
one family. And in this family, we see the mercy that came out of the Tower of Babel. And that is the family of Terah. Now, you might be saying at this point, who is this person? I've never heard of him before. I mean, really, his only claim to fame is that he was Abram or Abraham's dad. But, and yet, we see that Terah is the one who is mentioned. This is the, the, the opening verse. These are the generations, not of Abram, who is to be the father of the nation of Israel. We, I'm you know, ruining the story a little bit, but I, if you've read the Bible before, you know that Abram is, I mean, we sang it as kids. Father Abraham, you know, you know that song? Yeah. And I'm one of them, and you, so are you. Yeah. He's the one. He's the father of the nation of Israel, right? We knew this. And so who is this Terah? Why is he the one? That is going to be the blessing. Well, the reason we, that Moses, I believe, mentions Terah is because he's trying to set up tension for us. Tension in who the seed is going to come through. Now, I already relieved the tension for you because Abram is the one. But we're going to see this pattern over and again where God is going to stop his Toledot, his genealogy, with a person who has normally three sons. We saw him do it with Noah. Who is, who's going to be the promised seed of Noah? Well, it ends up being Shem, one of his sons. And today we're going to see that Abram is this son. And so we, here in the, the genealogy, you might just say, oh, this is boring stuff. It's just telling us a bunch of information. Uh, but in Hebrew narrative, it's very important. Every detail matters. And guess what? When we start to dig down into the details of this text, we're going to see that this family is jacked up. They're messed up. They are a messed up, crazy, young and the restless, well, I, mean, I mean, drama, drama, drama family. Just look at it. Look at what happens. Okay? Terah, he, he has three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Na Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered this guy Lot. Okay, this is important because it's, it's introducing to us the character. Well, now Haran, who we believe is the firstborn, dies. He dies in the presence of his father and in the land of Ur. And so that, not, not too crazy to this point, right? It's just kind of setting us up. It's, there, there's this family. They had some loss in the family, right? He leaves an orphan, Lot, right? And so there is tension that's starting to build. But here's where we really get into some drama. Here's where we really get into some craziness. Look at verse 29. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishkah. Okay, stop for a second. First of all, Abram marries Sarai. Now we're going to find out later, Sarai was his half-sister. So he marries his half-sister. Here we go. You ready? Well, this is some West Virginia type stuff here that's happening. <laughs> and then what happens? This other guy, Nahor, marries his niece. The, the one who, it tells us, Nahor's wife, Milcah, who was the daughter of Haran, his, his brother's daughter, he marries her. Again, jacked up family. It's a crazy, crazy family. Now, of course, we, we can... Uh, attribute this a lot to the flood and, and, and how there were not many people, but again, some messed up inbreeding stuff happening. It's like an ep episode of, uh, of, of the, the royal, I can't even remember the name of the show now. It's a royal show that's going on Netflix right now. I mean, it's just crazy, the stuff that's happening. But here we see uh, this, uh, this tension that's, that, become, that comes in verse 30. Sarai was barren. And she had no child. So in the midst of this jacked up family, we have even more drama, even more craziness. Sarai was not able to have kids. It tells us she was barren, meaning she was unable to have kids, and she had no kids. Probably makes sense why in the very next verse we see Abram and Lot having this kind of relationship that's very close. We, we, they have this close relationship. And they left from where they were, their jacked up home there in the Ur of Chaldees. And they left and they went to, it tells us, 
They went with uh, Haran and Sarai and all these people went together from the Ur of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But they came to this place, Haran. They settled there, and then Terah died. Now, we don't know why they settled there. We don't know why they settled in Haran. Maybe it was because that was the place named after uh, Terah's oldest son, and maybe he founded that city, and they were still kind of in their land. Maybe Terah was old, and he couldn't—I mean, 205, he— he wasn't a spring chicken, right? Maybe he just couldn't make the, the journey. Who, who, who knows? We don't know why they stopped there. Many commentators believe that they stopped there because Terah was being disobedient to the call of God. That God had called this family out of this mess in the earth of the Chaldeans. And he, he had called them out of this mess. And Terah said, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stop in Haran, which was another place that worshipped the moon god, just like in the Ur of Chaldeans. We don't know why they stopped there. But there is tension here. Why? Because this family is messed up. Does that describe any of your families? I mean, all your families are just perfect, right? Your kids, your grandkids, all just great, perfect, all the time. No, we, we can identify so much with what is happening here in, in the book and what's going to happen in the rest of the book of Genesis. Why? Because we're zooming in on people. It's almost as if we're following around these people. This is a messed up family. There are family problems. Lots of funerals, childlessness, and we're going to see betrayals and backstabbings and infighting. Drama, drama, drama. That is what we're going to see for the rest of the book of Genesis. I think we can all relate to this. All of us have families. We have people in our life. And if we were to look even at the, the best of us, if we were to look even at the best of us, there's messed up brokenness within us. You know those people who love the drama? You know anyone like this? They live for it. None of us have those in our family. Now, if, if you, don't, you don't know someone like this, you might want to take a look at yourself because you may be the one in your family that loves the drama. But there's drama. Why is there drama in our families? Because we're broken, sinful people who get angry, who are proud, who are full of, of jealousy and full of uh, all these things. And we, we, we can infight and we can, uh, you know, our, our great family gathering that we've looked forward to all year long, Easter dinner, right? We're looking forward to Easter dinner and it's, it's going to be awesome and we get all our family there and then what is it? it I mean, somebody poops all over the... the st I mean, I'm saying that a lot today. Ezra would love that I'm saying poop a lot today. But anyway, uh, it, somebody just gets in there and they have a bad attitude and they, or, or they mess it up. They show up in, in a weird way and, and it, people are messed up. And when we zoom into people's lives, what are we going to see? We're going to see messed up broken people. If we were to zoom into your life this morning, look at this past week, what would we see? Listen, I can tell you right now, I don't want you to see what, what my life was like this past week. Because you would see warts and all, not the clean presentation of a man that you see on Sunday mornings. You would see a, a father who has kids. Oh, oh no, oh, come on. You fathers out here, fa a father who has kids. Listen, I have kids, and they get on my nerves. And, they, and, and, and I, 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 sometimes, I even shared with the men's group this week, sometimes I, I, I'm just so angry I have to walk away from things. Right? We have to know what to do with our anger. I don't want you to see all of that. What will we see if we zoomed into your life this morning? Sinfulness, maybe. Anger. Bitterness. <coughs> lust. Pride, slothfulness. Look, follow someone around long enough and they will disappoint you. They will disappoint you. Why? Because we're all broken people. We're all broken people. Now you might be saying, Andrew, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a second. I'm a pretty good person. I, I do most stuff good, uh, uh, except for grammar, apparently. I do most stuff well. I try to be a good person. I, 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 I identify with what you were saying. I, I, like, I don't like to let people down. I don't like to hear those words, I'm disappointed in you. I, I, I try really hard. I, I'm a good person. 
Well, let me ask you this question. Why did God call Abram out of this family? Was it because he was a good person? Because he was lovely? He was awesome? God just looked down and said, okay, there's a cool person. I think I'm going to choose him. No. Abram married his half-sister. He was a messed up guy. He was messed up just like you and me. And yet God called him out of his brokenness, called him out of his messed up state. Not because he was some great person, not because he was awesome, but because of God's mercy and grace. You know what Jesus said when he came to earth? When he came to earth, he, he, went, to, he went to people who were broken. Why? Because we're all broken. Even though we may, may think we're a good person, even though we may feel righteous, we are all broken. Because sin has broken each of us. You know what Jesus did? He went and he reclined at the table in the house of tax collectors and, and sinners. And, and in the book of Mark, it says this. He was reclining in the table with many tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus with his disciples, and there were many who followed him. Many sinners and tax collectors who followed him. And one of the scribes of the Pharisees, one of those people who, who when I was saying, oh, we're all broken, we all come, they would have been like, no, 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 I'm a good person. I read the, the, the law uh, this many hours a day. I, I recite it. I stand in the corner and, and preach the word. But the scribe of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. Listen, this morning, God is calling to us in our brokenness. You want to know a foundational truth? A foundational truth that comes from the life of Abram? God calls even the most ungodly and broken people to himself. Praise God. God for that. Can, can I just say praise God for that? So this morning, it does not matter what we've done in our life. It does not matter how broken we are, how ungodly we feel, how much we feel like we failed people, how much we've disappointed people in our life. Why? Because God calls even the most ungodly and even the most broken people to him. Jesus didn't come to fix a bunch of righteous people. He came for the sinner. And listen, this morning, if we're still saying, well, I'm a pretty good person, I, I do pretty good stuff. It is not until we understand that we are sinful that we can have the call of God out of our brokenness. If we continue, what, what, what is the, the Bible says? The heart is wicked, desperately wicked. And we constantly deceive ourselves into thinking that we're better than we are. This morning, we need to understand that God calls even the most ungodly and broken people to himself. He called Abram. He called a broken, moon-worshipping, sister-marrying, crazy. I mean, he's going to do some crazy stuff. We're going to see him. He's not going to come out pretty and, 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 and all this stuff. He's not going to come out great and, and looking great and smelling like roses. He's going to be a broke. We're going to see him in his brokenness. He called him to himself. And he's calling you this morning. He's calling you. He's calling me. Why? Because we're broken. And he wants to fix us. And he wants to give us blessing. Look at what he does when he calls Abraham. Look at verse chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is the calling. This is, I, I actually believe what's happening here is we see uh, before verse 31, uh, we see 27 to 30 really being some background information. And then what I believe happens is verses 1 to 3 actually is the call of Abram before verse 31. And we see him reaction, reacting. Why? Because it doesn't really tell us in the, in the English, but in the Hebrew, if we were to look at this, this is actually a past tense verb, which means now the Lord had said. He did say. He said it uh, uh, before to Abram. Not at this time. He didn't say it a, a, after they left. He said to Abram before. And look at what he says. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house 
to the land that I will show you. And to this broken person who is constantly, I mean, he's going to be a constant disappointment to us. He was a constant disappointment to the people of Israel. When they read about all the messed up stuff that he had done in his life, I'm sure they would looked at him and said, he's the father of our nation? Really? God called him, God used him? To this man, this is what he says. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the blessing that God, when he called Abraham, he promised something to him. And listen, this morning, God is calling us to himself. But he's not just calling us just to to do whatever. He's calling us into blessing this morning. He's calling us just like he called Abraham and just like he called Abram into blessing. He's calling us also into blessing. Now, if we were to look at this blessing and to break it down as the nerd that I am wants to do, we'll see three things that he's promised here. He's promised three blessings, three things that he, God, will do. First, he's going to make of him a great nation, a great people. There's going to be this huge people that are going to come from him. So he's promising in that a child, a child to his barren wife. His wife was barren, remember? That's just not a throwaway detail. This promise means something. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a child. But she had no child. This relied on God. This was a promise of God. So, so the first thing we see God promising here is, is a great nation. But look at what's next. I will bless you and make your name great. Listen, there are a lot of people in the book of Genesis who wanted to have a great name. We read about it last week. The Tower of Babel, what did they say when, when, they, when they wanted to settle there and they wanted to make this, in verse 4 of chapter 11, you can flip right back there. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. You see, God promised, not that he had to make a name for himself, not that he had to do anything to earn it, but that he would make his name great. So we have a great nation, we have a great Name, But the third part, the third part is found down in verse 7. It's also kind of hinted at when he tells him to go to the land that he will show you. But the third part is that he would inherit the land. So we see God promising blessing on Abram's life to be a blessing to others in his name, in his land, and that making of him a great nation. This is the promise of God to a broken man. Look at how many times in this, these few verses, we have the phrase, I will. Verse, verse 1, I will show you. I will make your name great, verse 2. I will bless you and make your name great. I will, verse 3, bless those who curse you. And in him who honors you, I will curse Look at how many times God is promising. This is, I will, I will, I will. And guess what? If We're going to find out very quickly, even in the midst of, of this blessing, even though God's been calling Abram to himself, even though he's a broken person, we're going to see his brokenness. Again and again, God says, I will, I will, I will. And he's going to come through in every, every case. But it's almost as if Abram and his family is saying, I won't. At times, it's, it's like, I won't. I won't. I, I, I can't do that. I can't work on that. I can't work towards that. He didn't really obey God. He, he obeyed God here in verse 4 when he went and did what the Lord told him. But that obedience only came after a blessing. He was called... And he was given a blessing, a blessing of of being, uh, of all these things, this name, this people, this land. And his response was obedience. Listen, this morning, we're being called out of our brokenness. We're being called out of our, our ungodliness, out of our sinfulness. But we're given a promise. And guess what? This morning, our promise is very similar 
to the promise given to Abram. So we're not Abram this morning. We're not him. But our promise that we've been given is very similar. Jesus told us when he died for us that he would give us a new name. The book of Revelation tells us that we will all be given a new name, a name that is great. It's not our name, not one we made for ourselves. It's Christ's name. That name, un, uh, under, the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. We're going to be made into a new people, a great nation. It was mentioned this morning that there are revivals happening in our, our country to, today, this morning. We're a part of this tradition, a part of this, this people, these churches who love Jesus and want to see Jesus high and lifted up. We're part of a great nation, the church. We're given a name. We're given a, a people. And, and listen, we are promised a land. And this is not some kind of physical land. This is a heavenly home, a place in heaven. And this morning, we are all called out of our, unbro our brokenness and called to blessing. Blessing of a new name. Blessing of being a part of something bigger than us. And a blessing of having a heavenly home to call our own. But why? Why is this promise given to us? Well, listen, it's not because we're awesome people. It's not because you showed up to church this morning. It's because Jesus died for us. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't do anything to deserve it. Abram didn't do anything to deserve this call, this blessing of God on his life. He was simply given it. Paul talks about this call, this blessing in our life in this way, in another place. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. You see, this morning, we're called out of our ungodliness and brokenness. Not to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, not to fix ourselves, but because of God's grace. And we're promised blessing because of God's grace. Here's foundational truth number two. You ready for it? God's blessing does not come from obedience. God's blessing does not come from obedience, but from God's own perfect character. God's blessing does not come from our obedience. It comes from God's own perfect character. There was nothing that Abram can do. And listen, he's going to do a lot of jacked up stuff. A lot of stuff. But there was nothing he could do to thwart the blessing of God. There was nothing he could do. And listen, this morning, there is nothing that we can do when we respond to that call. There is nothing that we can do that can thwart that blessing. There's nothing we can do to lose heaven. There's nothing that we can do to be stripped of the name of Jesus. There's nothing we can do to be taken away from the church. It's only God's character and grace that we have this. Listen, as a dad, I feel this one. I feel this one. Because my kids don't always obey. They're not perfect. Can you imagine that? I know I talk about them a lot. But it's because what's happening in my life. It's what's going on in my life. They don't obey me a lot. And that sometimes that disobedience results in punishment. Sometimes that disobedience results in consequences. That was what we call them, consequences. They, they do something wrong, and so they get a consequence for that. Sometimes that consequence is they don't get to go a certain place. They don't, don't get to do a certain thing. This past week, my foster son got kicked out of daycare every day. Every single day this week, he got kicked out of daycare. He was five for five. 
pretty good. Friday came, and I, I could have been mad. Listen, I was at times. But because I love him, because of who I am, it was time for dinner. And every Friday, we try to go out to eat. We like to go to Pizza Inn. I saw, I saw uh, people on the way over there, too. And I could have said, son, you're not going. Five for five this week on getting kicked out of daycare. But listen, the blessing of going to family dinner, the blessing of going with me to, to eat at Pizza Inn was not contingent on his obedience. It was contingent on my love and grace towards him. So that's how God is with us. We can get kicked out of daycare five days in a row. And God, because of his character, because of who he is, not because of who we are, wants to still bless us. But there's something that in this, in this, we must do. Yes, God wants to bless us. God, it does not come from obedience. But guess what the response is when we are blessed? The response is the same that it needs, that Abram had. It has to be the same. God gave him the promise of blessing. He, he continually kept up his end of the bargain, even when Abram was unfaithful. But Abram's response to this blessing, to this covenant with him, is faith. It's faith. Look at what he does. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Aharon. And Abram took his, his wife and Lot and all our possessions, and they went to the land of Canaan. And what does he do? The, this faith produces in him, this blessing, the, the initiative of God produces in him obedience. It produces in him faith. It produces in him worship. Look at what he does in verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared for him. Look at verse 8. And there he moved to the hill country of the, on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with the Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. You see, in the midst of this blessing, in the midst of this calling... Abram responded with worship. He responded with worship. Listen, this morning, that must be our great response to what Jesus has done in our life. He has called ungodly, broken people like me, because, not because of some greatness in me, but because of his mercy and grace. And he's promised to bless me, even when I don't deserve it. My only response can be that of Abram's. Perfect worship. That's foundational truth number three. The only true response to God's call on our life is faith and worship. Faith and worship. You know, I've let a lot of people down in, in my life. No one have I let down more than God. I've tried to run from him. I've tried to not be a good person in my life. But God is always there, calling us back to himself. Listen, this morning, I, I want to close with this illustration that I thought was pretty cool. You know, the Mega Millions is 104 million right now. Did you know that? Don't go out and buy the lottery ticket. Your chances of winning are very slim. Very slim. But imagine you did. Okay, imagine you did. You bought that lottery ticket. And in a couple days when they, no one won this week, so in a couple days, like next weekend, when they, when they draw the numbers once more, they call your numbers. You match them all. Every single number. That's a great blessing. Right? You just won 104 million. Well, about 50 million after taxes. It's a great blessing. You just won the lottery. It would change your life. 
But imagine you took that ticket and you opened up a drawer and you tossed that ticket in the drawer and closed the drawer. You never went. You never, you never went and claimed the blessing. You never went and, 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 and turned in the ticket. What would people think of you? You're crazy. You're absolutely insane. Listen, this morning, all of us have won the lottery. It's not the Mega Millions. It's actually worth much more than that. God has called us ungodly, broken sinners as we are. He has promised us blessing upon blessing. The question is, will we respond? Will we turn in the lottery ticket and claim what God has promised is ours? Or will we take it the thing that was preached this morning, take the, the, the thing that we know to be true, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and crumple it up and put it into a drawer. What will we do? Will we respond in faith? Will we respond in worship? Or will we just sneer at it once again? The choice is ours this morning. Will we answer the call of God even as Abram answered the call? Even as Jesus himself answered the call, well, we too answered the call. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And I pray each of us this morning, God, we will respond very similar to the way Abram responded to your blessing. We will respond with faith and worship. Father, for those of us that are in here that I've never responded in faith. Help today to be the day that we do that. But for all of us who have responded in some sort of way in faith, help us this morning to continually worship you. Worship you with our life. Worship you with our song, with our time. Not because we're looking for anything, but because we've already been given it. God, I pray that your spirit would move, that would work as you call many more sons to yourself, many more daughters to yourself. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake.